Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. Many of you will remember I shared an experience recently that happened to Jane and her friend who were camping in the Aviemore area when they stayed at the Dalradi campsite. Jane spent a week with her friend on a wild camping adventure in Scotland. After a week of wild camping they found themselves in need of a shower and some amenities so they decided to stay on site and take advantage of the resources available. I want to quickly run through that account again, as Jane has provided us with an update, and it's a follow-up account of her husband Tom's experience in the same area. And then I'll share further accounts from people who've had awful experiences camping in the wilds of the UK. There was just a tent between me and it, and I prepared to die. Jane said, We'd been out during the day and come back late. Coming back in the car, we drove up the track to the camping bays. As we pulled up, an inner voice said to me, don't get out of the car, I'm sleeping here tonight. This was so contrary to the lovely day that we'd had. You know, why would something so negative pop into mind? My goodness, I shouldn't have ignored that. It was a lesson to always trust your gut instinct. Each night on the trip, we got into the odd pattern. You know, once we'd settled the dogs in their beds, we'd sit up chatting me and my friend for a while and plan the next stage of the journey. Once we'd done this, my friend would read a story from an old book she'd brought with her of celebrity ghost stories. It was a guilty pleasure and a bit of a laugh. It was about 11pm by then. I can't say for sure. I was enjoying the story when we both heard a really weird noise. The noise sounded like someone or some people walking up the trackway towards the camping bays. And at first, I thought it must be the French family who were the only other people on the campsite. Within a split second, I recognised that the sounds were not voices. It sounded odd, more like a handheld transistor radio. Who on earth would have or be playing with such a thing out here? But in another split second, I realised that the sound was on repeat you know, had someone recorded a sound sequence and they were playing it over and over again? Suddenly, every nerve and fibre in my body realised that actually this thing was heading in our direction and was coming for us. My friend realised it at exactly the same moment and she turned off her torch. She didn't say a word or move a muscle. It's very difficult to describe the sound. It was melodic, not human but not entirely animal either. But it was as intimidating a noise as you could ever hear. Oh my goodness, whoever or whatever was coming up the track was dangerous and unhinged. We just sat there frozen, not moving, barely breathing, as this terrifying thing came into our camping bay. I can't find the words to describe how unearthly and horrifying this sound was. It walked around the car, and came up to the entrance of our tent, and it lingered there for what seemed like an eternity. The sound was emanating a couple of feet at least above the apex of the tent, and that would have been about six feet, making this thing about eight feet tall. Then it walked around our tent, came to my side, and stood inches from my face. There was no smell, no heavy footfalls. I did hear one noise, but I can't tell you if that was a footfall or something being dropped. My emotion at this point was totally primal. This had escalated very quickly. I knew I was prey and I was totally helpless against whatever this was. It was just a tent wall between me and it and I prepared to die. I'm not being dramatic. I went beyond fear and became almost calm. I accepted there'd be no point fight. It was going to swipe at the tent and take me out in one hit. This thing was clearly huge. However, by some stroke of luck, this thing made its point and it started to move away from us. It went diagonally through the trees. I didn't hear the trees disturbed in any way or this thing brushing against them, but it definitely went in that direction. I listened to the sound disappearing in the distance and I grabbed my phone. I was about to put 999 in it, just in case it came back. My friend waited a while and then got into a sleeping bag and said, it's not coming back. I waited 
about two more hours in the same position, afraid that if I moved it would come back. I finally lay down about 2am with my thumb on the dial button of 999. Thankfully, we had no more further disturbance that night. I know the effects that this experience has had on Jane, and we've chatted back and forth over the last few months, and I can see that she's now at the stage where the need for answers outweighs any fear of the event itself or the fear of not being believed. Jane advised me that her husband had also had an experience in the same area many years ago now. Jane said, since you shared my story on your podcast, Deb, it's taken me to another level of reality. I was so emotional hearing you read out my story. I sobbed and sobbed during that podcast. I don't know why. Having my story shared has clearly been cathartic for me. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Deb. I don't feel as traumatised now. And it's all thanks to you. So as promised, here's part two of my story. And this is Jane's husband, Tom's story. I heard the boys screaming and I saw the tent shaking. A couple of years ago, Jane said, when all I had was time on my hands, I found myself thinking a lot about a terrifying experience I'd had when camping near Aviemore back in September of 2011. It was still weighing heavily on me 10 years on, as it, you know, as it was at that time. It was really frightening. And I wondered if I could find anything that kind of could shed some light on any part of it. I decided to start by finding the photographs I'd taken during the holiday to Scotland. And when I was there, something stalked our tent. And I honestly thought we were going to die. Well, I found some of the photos and looking at the pictures of our tent pitched at the holiday park just made it all real again. And how close to danger we'd come with just that flimsy tent barrier between us and it, whatever it was. My husband came in, looked over my shoulder and asked what I was looking at. He made a silly comment, you know, was I looking to book a holiday? As the whole world was locked down at the time, so obviously the answer was no. That's his silly sense of humour, which I love. I smiled at him and said that the camping pictures were mine and had taken them during a trip, you know, when that strange thing happened to me near Aviemore. I hadn't really told him my story at that point. He asked me the name of the camp that we'd stayed at as it looked familiar to him when he was looking at the photos. And on hearing the name, he said, I thought it was that place. Hmm. I went there a few times when I was in the army and something odd happened to me there. And as he said these words, it did cross my mind that surely he wasn't about to recount a story similar to mine. No, this was going to be a UFO or a ghost story. No one could have a story like mine. However, this is what he told me. Tom. Back in the 1970s, the Ministry of Defence used those fields. They used to rent them off the farmer. It was just farmland then. No tents or caravans, just some wild land. I spent a lot of time at Aviemore as a ski instructor in the army, but I mainly would stay on the farmland with my junior soldiers. We'd take them to that place to experience camping, lighting a fire, map reading, you know, how to keep warm in cold temperatures, etc. It was to toughen them up a bit. We'd go up in colder weather to make it a bit more challenging for them. Anyway, I had my own tent and our new recruit shared a big ridge tent. It didn't take them long to fall asleep after the exercise they'd had that day. It must have been in the early hours of the morning, just before dawn as it was still dark. But you could start to see the first light appearing. I woke up suddenly for some reason. You know that kind of snap of your fingers, split second thing when you're completely awake from a deep sleep? As a soldier, my first thought was, what's wrong? Was there danger? I couldn't hear anything, but I was frozen to the bone. There was no reason for me to be this cold. It was an unearthly cold though, so I knew that something odd was going on. I stayed perfectly still and just took in my surroundings calming myself as best I could. Yet, yeah, something was moving around the camp and it wasn't any of the boys. I could hear them all snoring. I could make out something breathing and sniffing near the other tents. I knew instinctively that this was something strange. As it came closer, it didn't sound like any animal I knew, domestic or wild. Whatever it was, it was big and heavy. I heard the tent shake and the boys started screaming but they were all too afraid to move. 
I knew somehow the best thing to do was to stay calm and stay still. It then made a beeline for my tent and whatever it was, it came to stand right in front of the entrance and it was my turn. I felt whatever it was, was really pissed off that we were there on that land. I just remained calm, but it was quite frightening as I knew this thing was trying to intimidate me. Being a hippie at heart, I laid there not reacting to it with my palms up and I sent thoughts out to it. I tried to send positive energy to it. I kept saying, we mean you no harm. I'm sorry if we've angered you, but I'm here trying to show these young ones how to survive in the wild, how to have respect for nature. We mean no offence and we'll be leaving today. I'm really sorry. I just kept saying things like that over and over. However, it grabbed the ridge of my tent and shook it violently. I held my nerve. I didn't react. I knew it was testing me, but I felt it wasn't going to hurt us. After a little while, it seemed satisfied that it had made its point, and then it went on its way, grunting and snuffling in displeasure. I didn't know what to make of it all. No one mentioned it the next day. I think they were all happy to pretend that it, it was just one of us in charge, you know, playing a joke on them. The lads were happy to be breaking camp. They'd enjoyed their night in spite of the early morning visit. I did speak with one of the guys who was on fire duty that night. You know, someone who would say at the camp and watch the fire throughout the night in case the tents caught fire or anything like that. He said he'd seen the lad's tent shake violently just before dawn. I asked him if he saw anyone moving around and he said, no, there was no one outside the tent. Whoever it was was shaking it, must have been doing it from the inside. The silly sods were pranking the mates, no doubt, he said. How could that be? The creature was shaking the tent, but he couldn't see it. This creature sounded like it must have been invisible then. The boys weren't pranking each other. I knew that by now how subdued they were when they were packing up. All bravado had gone from them. They chipped themselves in that tent and they knew deep down this was something odd. They weren't daft. Jane said, as Tom told me his story, I was glad. I sat down. How could it be possible that my husband had not only been to the same place as me camping, um, you know, that would be a coincidence anyway, but to have an all too similar experience of an unknown creature at the same place, well, I just couldn't find the words. I still can't. This was impossible. Back at the time, I thought I must have been the only one in the UK to have gone through what I'd gone through. And now I find that my husband had also not only had a similar experience to me, it was in exactly the same place. I've heard of synchronicities, but this was ridiculous. What were the odds of this? Why? Why did we both experience the same thing 40 years apart? I wish someone could tell me what is going on here. Hearing the story didn't bring me any comfort, actually. It just added to the trauma somehow. And I abandoned doing any research into the subject. The strangeness has heightened even more so. I wasn't ever going to find answers or, you know, anyone that would understand us. I was left in a horrible limbo. It was all too much. So from then, until just a short while ago, until I found you, Deb, it was bad. What happened to us haunted me every day. I'm so grateful to you for giving people like us a platform to share our stories. Just being a listening ear has released so much of the negative energy I was bound to. I'll never be the same again. How could anyone? But you sharing my stories helped me no end. And I have a healthier attitude to the whole episode now. Thanks, Deb. Jane and Tom. I know the serendipity mentioned here seems strange. But I do know of another couple who both had experiences on the same road in Littlestone in Staffordshire. The gentleman in the couple, his name was Ant, and he saw a horrible beast on the road when he was a young boy. And he was in the car with his mum. And he also saw it later as a teen. Many decades later, he met his partner Mel. And one night when they were chatting, Mel explained how she'd seen a horrible creature on that road one night when she was driving. The creature was standing on the same road where Ant experienced his creature as a child. 
there is another serendipity at play. And that's the amount of reports that are around that very small area that mention the feeling of dread or the presence of an invisible being. Aviemore, you know, is also the area where the famous John Rennie Snow footprints were found. There are many reports made by mountaineers, guides, rangers, hikers, climbers and visitors to the area who have made their own reports over the years. Now I want to share a new case file with you, one that's coming very recently. I received it from a young lady named, named Siobhan who had some weird experiences close to the well-known Rendlesham Forest when she was staying out in the wild in a car when she was given worrying advice from a police officer. Siobhan contacted me after a camping trip in the summer of 2019 and something took place that has really puzzled her and she's not returned to that particular area to camp again. She also shared a number of other events that have taken place and I've included them here. She's also one of the ever-growing communities of van dwellers, car campers, or as I like to call them, the living free society. It's how we all once lived, you know, when we could travel freely with the seasons before being settled and chained in bricks and mortar as is now the norm. I've taken reports from many people in the travelling community, camping community, van lifers, car lifers, wild campers, over the years. It's not surprising. The more time you spend in nature, the easier it is for you to tune into it. And over time, it happens without realising. You click with the soul of the area. It's why so many of us yearn for open spaces and countryside. It's why so many of us have such awful mental health because we're caged in into a, ca a concrete jungle. This account's called, I never camped there again. The police said I was vulnerable. Siobhan said, in August of 2019, I decided to go camping, which is something I love to do. The first campsite I stayed at had a meadow, like a large garden at the rear of the barn, and a farmhouse with trees and hedgerows. There are moan areas where the tents are to be placed, and I chose a space near a huge tree near the barn and the toilet facilities. I spent a glorious week there at the beginning of August with lots of other campers and nothing untoward happened. The area is full of wildlife. A pair of tawny owls inhabited the campsite and deer were seen. You could see them walking around. I returned to the campsite again as I enjoyed it so much and I booked in at the end of August for two nights and I set up in the same area as before. The first night there were several other campers on site but on the second night, I was on my own. About 2.15am, I woke up suddenly and I realised the moon was full and bright. And as I sat inside the tent, deciding whether to leave, you know, to use the camp facilities or stay and use the tent facilities, I noticed an orange flashing light. And it took me a few seconds to realise the light that I was seeing was my car unlocking itself silently. And I thought, what the hell? I reacted by reaching over to the car keys and pressing the lock button. Now the car is being locked up loudly as one of the wing mirrors judges and makes a noise. So of course now I'm fully awake. My ears turn into elephant ears as I strain to hear anything. The car's never done this before or since. I said to myself, it's best to sleep the rest of the night in the car. So I used the facilities inside the tent gathered up my sleeping bag and my purse of belongings and opened the car door. And as I was standing there by the car, I looked up at the night sky, which was clear and full of the most wonderful stars. I had a quick look around and got into the car. I covered myself up totally with a sleeping bag and locked the car and I went to sleep. At no time was I scared. I didn't see or hear anything other than my car unlocking itself quietly. I told the farmer's wife in the morning what had happened and she thanked me for letting her know. It was only later that I realised that all the wildlife usually so prevalent in the meadow had gone elsewhere. They could be heard in the distance. Everything in the campsite was completely silent. I've never gone back to that particular campsite. It is good to share this with people though who understand. She said, I do have faith in Jesus Christ and I always pray whenever I go to a campsite. I cleanse the area, I ask for protection, I ask to meet friendly people and for me to wake up if anyone comes. Except now, the last request is to wake up 
before anyone or anything comes. I asked Siobhan if she'd mind sharing any other experience that she'd had that stood out to her as unusual in any way. And she sent me a number of events that she was happy to share. Siobhan said, there's a gift of knowing and that's the best way I can describe it. It's come from my mother's side of the family. I know my maternal grandmother had it and I'm quite sure mum had it, although it wasn't something she discussed. My youngest brother and I have it, varying degrees. Personally, most of it's useful things. The knowing comes as words impressed on my brain, not voices. A sense of something, like a spiritual nudge, or I'll get visual messages on the brain. And that's the best way I can express how it happens. However, the knowing always serves to benefit and to warn. It's never been detrimental. I have had spirit encounters now and then down the years, some benign and two that have definitely been hostile. One benign encounter happened in the very old house in Old Harwich. I'm unsure of the year, although I know it was between 2014 and 2016. I was a visitor and I was being shown around the property in daylight. We went down to the lower ground floor. The outside road pavement levels had altered over the years. And the woman said sometimes a lady can be seen sitting looking out of the window, probably waiting for her loved ones to return from war or at sea. And at that moment, I got an electric charge at the top part of my body, at my head and my arms and my chest. I was completely calm and unafraid. The woman said, I can see by your face that something's happened. What's going on? And I told her about the electric charge and I said, it felt as though the lady was saying, you may not be able to see me, but I am here. And then between 2019 and 2023, I've had periods of hidden homelessness where I've been staying with friends or in supported living accommodation and also periods of living in my car. In 2020, late August, I was in Lincolnshire between Spalding and Stamford. The first few days of living in the car were spent mostly in laybys on the side of a busy road. Or, for example, there was this one night that I decided to venture into the countryside and park up near Belmsthorpe. I drove around for ages looking for possible places to park up safely and without hopefully being in the way, you know, of any farmers who were still harvesting. I spotted a possible place, although just before I saw the place, I also saw another car completely out of the ordinary. What came to mind instantly was it this some kind of spooks car, MI6 or MI5 government car. It was far too clean and the chrome was shiny, and it was sitting at the road in front of a long concreted drive with some secure punch gates. Having spotted this possible place, I drove round for a bit, came back to it in different ways to avoid the spooks car. At about 9.25, I backed up to the gate of a ploughed field, tried to settle down. It was a full moon, which at that time was bright white, although opposite it was another gated area that was very dark. Since I was a child, I've been afraid of the dark, and even then in my late fifties, my heart started to pound. I thought, if you don't get hold of your fear and work out what causes it, then you're not going to be here for very long. So I remembered an incident when I was eight years old, when I managed to talk myself into a calm state, and I used that to help me settle down. While I was sitting there with the sleeping bag up to my eyes and a beanie over my head, I watched what I can only describe as a hairy boulder walking up the road towards the opposite gate because that's exactly what it looked like. I was unable to discern a head and I told myself it must be a badger. It looked totally weird. It walked on four stubby short legs and disappeared under the opposite gate. Before settling off to sleep, I did my usual praying of cleansing and protection and asking to wake me up, you know, if anyone comes. And between bouts of sleep, I noticed that once it went really quiet, the lane got busy. It was a hive of activity. Four cars drove by at speed. Maybe it was a spooks car, who knows. Then about 12 midnight, a farmer's bright green vehicle passed with lots of flashing lights on top. And I thought, now you're done for it. However, it took until about 1.30 before the police car showed up. 
I woke up just as it's parked up and I saw this odd looking silhouette. One of the policemen got out and came over to the car. I opened the driver's door so he was unable to get around and he asked me my name, what I was doing there, etc. And I was honest. I said I had run out of money, although the next day I'd get paid and I had somewhere to go. He then did something strange. As he was looking around, he said, you know, you're vulnerable out here, don't you? You know, at the time I was tired. I didn't really take it on board. We both left, so I got back to settle down again. I woke about 4.25 in total terror. I had a waking nightmare where I was talking to someone in my dream, saying, Susan, stop tugging on my sleeping bag. An imaginary Susan would say, I'm not tugging on your sleeping bag. At which point I woke up, thinking someone was in the car. It was a complete fright and flight moment. Bodily fluids all went south and I had to use the onboard facilities and I drove the hell out of there. On the way to Sanita and a lay-by on a busy road, I got the presence of mind to phone a friend, although I texted first as it was so early. I did pat myself on the back for staying out in the dark for seven and a half hours though. Later on, talking to a friend she was appalled that the police left me there on my own and didn't make me move on i realized that when i woke up in terror the moon was blood orange had i experienced a nightmare due to being vulnerable as the policeman had said except i got the distinct impression that this policeman knew something i never went back to that place not even in daylight however the policeman was right i was vulnerable and I could have disappeared without a trace. And after that incident, I kept my car tidier, put all my personal items in storage at night, and became more self-aware about my surroundings and my environment. When I had money, I stayed on a bona fide campsite. And when in the car, I stayed in different places each night. If my position becomes vulnerable or compromised, I move. I think that's really sensible advice. Whether you're camping, hiking or just walking the dog. If you get a sudden feeling of dread or your gut instinct tells you to back out of the area, I would strongly advise you to do that. That warning's there for a reason. One, that you would have listened to many centuries ago. Call it what you will. It's a primal alarm and you need to respond to it. Don't push it away. Don't explain it away. Don't push in regardless or invoke or disrespect what's there. Make a conscious effort to leave that area and go somewhere else until the feeling subsides and you feel safe again. I wonder what the police officer was referring to when he told Siobhan she was in a vulnerable area. She was out in the fields, far away from the hustle and bustle of the town. They'd be the odd local travelling to and from work during the night or a farmer out on his rounds. It seems far safer to me to sleep there than in a busy neighbourhood or a city parking lot. You know, Relmption is not known for its high crime rates. Another well-known area here in the UK, known for its strange experiences, is the Moody Moor of Dartmoor. From tales of smugglers and highway man of old to modern day reports of misty figures and eyes shine in the mist that are shared amongst friends and family alike. In a camping blog, I came across a report from one chap who had a terrifying encounter in 2015. I heard a loud, clear, guttural groaning howl, and this report comes in from a wild camper. I was wild camping by Black Tor in October of 2015. It was clear, but windy and very cold. I woke in the dead of the night to find my dog sat bolt upright by the inner tent door. Thinking he needed to call of nature, I reluctantly crawled out from my sleeping bag, opened the door, stepped out into the black with him. It was a moonless night, and if not for my head torch, I would have been as blind because it was completely black. Anyway, not behaving as I expected, the dog seemed absolutely pinpointed on something off in the distance, but staying very close to my heel. As I gazed over, I saw nothing within the torchlight, but two pinkish eye-like reflections staring back at us in the distance, beyond where the light could reach. Though I remember thinking it was likely a sheep or a pony, 
you know, enjoying local folklore. I knew the stories of black ghostly hounds and other mysterious beasts which walk the moors at night, and my imagination got hold of me. Grab me for the dog, waded back into the tent quickly, and as soon as I was in, and the door zipped up, my head torch failed with a dramatic flicker, and it would not turn back on. No joke, no lie to it, it was then that I heard a loud, clear, guttural, groaning howl, and it was low-pitched and incredibly sorrowful. I've been around sheep, ponies, cows and horses my whole life, and I've never heard a sound like it. I will never forget it as long as I live. I did not sleep a wink that night following this encounter, as something about it really shook me to my core. I felt weakened, frightened, and strangely sad. But as soon as the sun rose, I was packed up and heading home. I saw nothing in the area when walking mm. back, but it'll be a long while until I head back up for a night upon the hill of Black Tor. It would seem that the dog was clearly aware there was a threat of some kind waiting, watching out there in the dark. It reminds me of Andy and Tika when he was walking his dog in Cumbria and she was clearly fixed onto something. In our last case tonight, I want to share with you one of the most terrifying experiences I know where climbers have been subjected to outright horror. And this is my fright night in the haunted Bother at Louis Belt Lodge. On a Christmas climbing trip in 1973, two young climbers experienced a frightening series of events in a remote mountain Bother. Phil McNeil was 18 and a member of Glasgow's Long Side Climbing Club when he and his friend Jimmy Dunn set out from the city for the Lochabar Hills. They took the train to Bullock and then headed a lift into Kinnacleven near Fort William and from where they set on foot 10 miles to the Louisville Lodge. It used to be a farmer deer stalking lodge, now it's in ruins. The men knew stories being recounted for by Phil for the BBC radio show were told there were people living off grid at Louisville, but it remained open and welcoming to visitors. Phil and Jimmy hoped to see it as a base for their climbing trip, and when they arrived, the door was locked. Looking through the windows, the men could see dishes in the sink, but no one inside. The pair headed off to do some climbing in the snow and ice before returning about 9 pm. It was pitch dark. We shone our torches through the windows and nothing seemed to have changed. It was much colder inside than outside. It felt odd. It became obvious that this place had been vacated very rapidly. The men were able to get inside through an unsecured window. There was a table set for Christmas dinner, crackers still to be pulled. Exploring the property, the men noted each room was furnished and appeared to have been occupied, except one. A bedroom directly above the living room. The small bedroom had a dismantled metal bed frame lying against a wall and a window with curtains open. On the windowsill, there was a large stone. The climbers went down to the living room and crawled into their sleeping bags for the night. Bill said, it was extremely cold and the silence was palpable. It enveloped you. Almost the minute we blew out our candles, there were noises upstairs. First, they heard footsteps, then noises of the bed being pulled together, you know, followed by what sounded like a rock from the window being rolled across the floor. Phil next recalls being awoken about 4am when the living room erupted with the sound of objects, including the men's pickaxes, being thrown all over the place in the darkness. I was absolutely terrified, said Phil. I was petrified. The room fell silent again. Phil lit a candle, but it was sent flying across the room. And next, the sound of footsteps again, but this time stomping down a spiral staircase from the upstairs to the closed living room door. Grabbing his ice axe, Phil went to the door and threw it open, but he said no one was there. It was then the climbers decided to make their escape out of an open window, and shining their head torches to the upstairs bedroom window. Phil says they saw the curtains were now closed. The men fled. Phil, who sought out other people's experience of the Buffy, believes no one could have been hiding in the lodge or arrived after they did. We would have seen the footprints in the snow. I don't know what the men encountered that day or why it happened to them. I just know I've taken reports like theirs 
from many of the Buffy's wild places. Campsites, craggy outcrops, where people find their peace here in the UK. There are strange reports. So many of our wild places have the scariest tales to tell. I also understand their fear and how living with the experience going forward, what that can be like. I'd like to thank Jane and Tommy and Siobhan for sharing their experiences with us. I'm honoured to help people bring their truth into the public eye. Let's keep doing that until discussing these events is as normal as a chat with a friend over coffee. As after all, it's us who are experiencing the activity. And for some, that can be daily. Thank you for joining me today and I hope you'll join me for future episodes. I release content like this every week and I'm sure I'll cover a topic you enjoy, so don't miss out. Hit that follow or like button. Please check out my YouTube and Patreon memberships for early or exclusive content. And you can find the link to them and my social media and donation sites in one handy link tree below. BBR is not funded, so any donation, no matter how small, is highly appreciated. So I will bid you adieu and I will be back at the same time, the same day, with more from the BBR case files.